I would like to thank the organizing committee and KDGO for the invitation to speak at this meeting. Um, today, I will be highlighting some of the key messages uh, from the recently published uh, KDGO guideline on the management of diabetes uh, in people living with chronic kidney disease. These are my disclosures. Following a controversy conference held in 2015, KDGO commissioned a working group with diverse backgrounds to develop a set of guidelines uh, on diabetic kidney disease. Now, this working group consisted of nephrologists, cardiologists, endocrinologists, uh, family physicians, clinical trial specialists, uh, and we had dietitian, and most importantly, patients. The working group had met uh, twice on a face-to-face -face basis and went through a series of iterations to develop the guidelines uh, in its current uh, published form. Now, before I go into the guideline proper, perhaps I would like to um, highlight uh, the format of the guideline. Now, KDGO has uh, recently adopted a brand new format in presenting its guidelines, um, where clinical recommendation statements um, are interspersed with practice points. Now, this slide highlights the summary document that is provided in the guideline uh, and it explains the differences between clinical recommendations and practice points. Clinical recommendations uh, are graded on the strength of the recommendation uh, as well as the quality of the evidence. Now, level one is a strong recommendation to, uh, and is articulated uh, by we recommend and level two um, is a weaker recommendation and stated by we suggest. Now, the quality of the evidence is divided uh, into four different grades, uh, A to D, where grade A is uh, uh, given when there is a high quality of evidence and grade D when there is a very low quality of evidence. Practice points, uh, on the other hand, are not graded for strength of recommendation or quality of evidence. Um, they are largely the expert opinions of the working group and are consensus statements regarding an aspect of care uh, where the evidence is lacking uh, or is of extremely poor quality. Now, occasionally, uh, they make reference to observations for which uh, studies have not yet been performed uh, but are of uh, clinical significance, whereby the working group felt that uh, the lack of clinical guidance will have a detrimental effect on outcomes. So practice points uh, may take the form of a clinical statement, uh, a figure, a table, or even an algorithm. The final guideline um, is divided into five different chapters that's listed in this slide. Now, in the interest of time, I would not uh, be able to go through um, every single chapter or clinical recommendation statements. Uh, I would instead highlight some key messages in the guideline that may require more discussion uh, or have uh, important clinical implications. Let's begin with chapter one, which deals with uh, comprehensive care. Now, chapter one provides a general overview in the care of people uh, living with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Now, practice point 1.1.1 summarizes the approach in this chapter and, and state that patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease should be treated with a comprehensive strategy to um, reduce the risk of kidney disease progression and cardiovascular disease. Now, the figure on the right here lists the various components of this comprehensive strategy. And one of the key components of comprehensive care is articulated in clinical recommendations uh, 1.2.1 which deals with the importance of using uh, renin angiotensin system blockade in our patients. Now, the statement reads that we recommend treatment with an ACE inhibitor or ARB uh, be initiated in patients with diabetes, hypertension, and albuminuria, and that these medications should be titrated to the highest approved dose that is well tolerated. Um, and this is given uh, a grading of 1B. Now, the data for the use of RAS blockade in individuals with uh, diabetes and associated hypertension uh, is well established uh, with well-designed trials 
such as Renal, IDNT, IRMA2, and innovation studies um, demonstrating their benefits in renal protection and reduction uh, in the risk for mortality. Now, however, the use of RAS blockade agents in the diabetic population uh, without hypertension is more contentious. Um, so while most of the studies uh, evaluating RAS blockade in people with uh, diabetes included individuals with hypertension exclusively, um, the RENOW study and the INNOVATION trial uh, recruited a proportion of people without elevated blood pressure. Um, this was about 3.5% uh, in the renal study and about 31% in innovation. Now the innovation trial also conducted a subgroup analysis of the non-hypertensive cohort uh, and, and found that individuals without elevated blood pressure uh, who were randomized to receive telmisartan had a reduced risk of uh, transiting um, to worsening stages of diabetic kidney disease in a dose-dependent manner. So therefore, uh, while the data is limited, now, in the absence of a preferred therapeutic agent, uh, the work group proposed uh, in practice point 1.2.1 that ACE or ARB treatment uh, should be considered in patients with diabetes and albuminuria uh, but have uh, normal blood pressure. Now, because of the key importance of ACE inhibitors and ARB in mitigating the progression of diabetic kidney disease, uh, the guideline also provided guidance on managing scenarios uh, where RAS blockade may be easily stopped so that uh, all attempts can be done in ensuring as many patients stay on the treatment uh, as possible. Now, this includes uh, hyperkalemia uh, as well as an acute rise in serum creatinine uh, after starting or increasing the dose uh, of uh, ACE inhibitor or ARB. Now, other measures uh, such as these listed here should be implemented first. Uh, when these clinical situations occur uh, before stopping uh, the drug prematurely. We will move on to chapter two, which uh, deals with glycemic targets. Now in clinical recommendation uh, 2.1.1, we recommend that HbA1c be used uh, to monitor glycemic control in patients with diabetes and CKD, and this is uh, with a 1C grading. Now, while there are situations uh, in patients with CKD where the value of HbA1c may not be accurate in assessing glycemic control, uh, HbA1c uh, is still a good prognostic um, marker for the development of micro and macrovascular complications. Um, the, the guidelines uh, uh, do provide information in which uh, uh, HbA1c may underestimate or overestimate glucose control so that the clinician may be aware as kidney failure progresses. Now, uh, practice uh, point 2.1.2 um, uh, draws attention to, uh, to these situations um, and highlights uh, some of the nuances uh, of using HbA1c uh, in estimating glycemic control in patients, uh, especially in advanced uh, CKD. Now, following this, Clinical Recommendation 2.2.1 recommends uh, an individualized uh, HbA1c target ranging from 6.5% uh, to 8.5% uh, 8 in patients with diabetes and non-dialysis dependent CKD, and this is given a 1c grading. Uh, now, the spirit behind this recommendation is really to balance the benefits of uh, tight glycemic control with organ protection and the risk of uh, life-threatening and symptomatic uh, hypoglycemia, uh, especially in specific high-risk uh, patient groups. Um, so in uh, people who are elderly uh, with many comorbidities um, or shortened life expectancy or where kidney failure is advanced, a more liberal HbA1c target is acceptable. And finally, I would like to spend more time discussing some of the recommendations uh, coming out of Chapter 4, uh, which deals with anti-glycemic therapies. Uh, now, this is, uh, has been an exciting time where uh, data has been coming out with novel 
uh, therapeutic agents and definitely this chapter uh, commands a, a much greater uh, attention and uh, time in discussing the, the clinical recommendations. This chapter um, opens with recommendations and practice points on the use of metformin uh, as a predominant treatment for hyperglycemia. Now, in fact, uh, recommendation 4.1.1 uh, stated uh, upfront that in patients with uh, EGFR greater than or equal to 30, we recommend that metformin be used uh, as the first line treatment for hyperglycemia. Now, the rationale for this uh, comes from several uh, clinical benefits with the use of metformin, uh, including uh, weight loss, uh, the lower risk for hypoglycemia, and some possible suggestion of uh, cardiovascular protective uh, effect. Uh, in addition, metformin is widely available in many parts of the world. Uh, it is one of the cheapest medication uh, and has been around for a long time, so physicians are also more familiar with its use. Now, I want to highlight that uh, metformin uh, is being uh, uh, recommended as a first-line treatment for the purpose of hyperglycemia uh, and not so much uh, for uh, organ protective effect. And following these recommendations, there are a series of practice points on the use of metformin uh, in patients uh, who has a kidney transplant. Um, and it also uh, provided guidance on the, the need to monitor EGFR and the need to adjust the dose of metformin uh, as kidney failure pro uh, progresses uh, with a reduction in the EGFR. Uh, in practice point 4.1.4, uh, we also suggested monitoring uh, patients for vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, which has been reported uh, in prolonged uh, usage of metformin for more than four years. So together with uh, these uh, practice points uh, focusing on the practicalities of using metformin, uh, this figure summarizes um, some of the expert opinion on the dose uh, reduction required for metformin uh, with uh, worsening kidney function. Uh, it's also provided some suggestion on the monitoring uh, frequency of the kidney function to, as well as uh, that for vitamin B12 deficiency with prolonged use. Um, the guideline uh, will also provide an approach in managing the concerns of lactic acidosis with the use of metformin and this is uh, generally um, accessed to be uh, of low risk uh, even in the population to reduce uh, EGFR if the clinical situation uh, is uh, being managed appropriately. Uh, I will not spend too much time on this uh, as these are uh, nicely summarized uh, in the guidelines. Then as we move on further into the chapter on INT uh, glycemic therapies, one would notice the clinical recommendations uh, that came uh, about from the various organ protective trials of uh, novel anti-glycemic agents over the later half of this decade. Now, it was only in uh, 2015 uh, when the first trial on SGLT2 inhibitors uh, opened up the exciting view uh, of this class of drug in not just uh, cardiovascular protection, but also the possibility of reducing uh, renal endpoints in a way that is much bigger than brass blockade. Uh, and uh, not too long after that, um, uh, in 2016, uh, results of the LEADER trial highlighted the possible benefits of another novel uh, anti-glycemic agent, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, in a similar manner. So naturally, uh, many clinical practice uh, recommendation guidelines have undergone several changes in uh, response to these uh, new cardiovascular outcome trials. Uh, as well as a subgroup analysis of uh, renal endpoints. And, and this is uh, summarized uh, in, in this uh, slide. Uh, you will notice that most, uh, uh, since the publication of the MPAR-REG study, as well as even the LEADER trial over the period of 2016 to 2018, uh, there have been new uh, changes made to various international guidelines. 
Now, hence, based on the outcomes of the systematic review performed by the evidence review team, uh, the working group put forth clinical recommendations uh, 4.2.1, which states that in patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, and EGFR greater or equal to 30 ml per minute per 1.73 meter squared, we recommend uh, including an SGLT2 inhibitor in the anti-hypoglycemic uh, treatment regimen. And this is the only 1A recommendation in the entire guideline. And because this is a novel therapy, uh, the, the guideline uh, also uh, provided several practice points uh, that are listed here. Um, so it gives uh, guidance on uh, the addition of SGLT2 inhibitors to individuals uh, who has good glycemic control who are, or who has poor glycemic control. Um, and the, the choice uh, in, of SGLT2 inhibitor in practice point 4.2.3 should prioritize agents with documented cardiovascular uh, or kidney benefits and take the EGFR into account. Now, this recommendation came hot on the trails of the overwhelming results of the Credence study. Now, this was the first published trial evaluating the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in individuals with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. Uh, and having renal endpoints uh, as a primary outcome. So the primary outcome is a composite uh, kidney endpoint inclusive of a doubling of serum creatinine, the occurrence of end-stage kidney disease or death due to cardiovascular or kidney disease. Now, the study recruited about uh, 4,400 patients with a mean EGFR of 57 and albuminuria uh, close to one gram a day and found a 30% reduction uh, in the risk of the primary outcome. Uh, and uh, similar effects were also seen with the reduction uh, in the risk of end-stage kidney disease alone. A systematic review of the Credence, as well as the other three major cardiovascular outcome trials of SGLT2 inhibitors, namely DECLARE, CANVAS and EMPOWERAGE outcome studies further strengthened uh, the significant benefits of SGLT2 in both cardiovascular and renal protection. Now, these benefits were consistent. Uh, the magnitude of the effects uh, was significant and uh, with high precision, uh, therefore earning this clinical recommendation a uh, high grading of 1A. Now, and the, the recent publication of the DAPA CKD trial will further strengthen this recommendation because uh, two-thirds uh, of the study population in the DAPA CKD study uh, included patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease and, and the study had also shown uh, similar benefits uh, of uh, dabatiflozin. Uh, therefore, uh, in the approach of using SGLT2 inhibitors in people with diabetic kidney disease, a uh, consideration is made to use SGLT2 inhibitors uh, for the purpose of organ protection, uh, meaning uh, for the reduction in the risk of progression of diabetic kidney disease or to harness the cardioprotective effects uh, of the drug. Um, and it is, uh, SGLT2 is not really uh, used for the main purpose of uh, glycemic control. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the published studies uh, uh, suggested that SGLT2 inhibitors has a modest effect on HbA1c reduction and, and uh, really just reduces HbA1c by about 0.5 to about 0.9 or at most 1%. Um, therefore, in a patient with well-controlled blood sugar profile, a reduction in the other uh, diabetic medication should be considered uh, to make way for the use of SGLT2 safely. And because SGLT2 inhibitor is a novel therapeutic agent, uh, many may not be familiar with the side effect profile of the drug. Now, in particular, we would like to highlight the risk of euglycemic uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, which have been found to increase uh, by threefold uh, 
with particular clinical situations in, in people taking SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, therefore, in practice point 4.2.4, uh, we wanted physicians to be aware that during periods of uh, prolonged fasting or critical uh, medical illness, where the risk of ketosis is high, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors should be withheld, or if necessary, uh, patients should be screened for the development of ketoacidosis, as the blood sugar profile may be normal and not be elevated uh, in the traditional diabetic ketoacidosis uh, presentation. Um, uh, the rest of the practice points that follows the recommendations on SGLT2 inhibitors uh, also provided uh, guidance and information uh, with regards to some of the other common side effects of SGLT2, uh, such as uh, hypovolemia. Um, and it also uh, provided uh, some guidance on what to do with uh, uh, SGLT2 when there is a decline in the EGFR or when the EGFR falls below the recommendation of uh, 30 mL per minute uh, per 1.73 meters squared. Um, in practice point 4.2.8, uh, we have also stated that SGLT2 has not been adequately studied in kidney transplant recipients, um, and, but because they are immunosuppressed and potentially at increased risk for infection, um, the recommendation to use SGLT2 inhibitors um, does not apply to kidney transplant recipients. So moving away from SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, we recommend in recommendation 4.3.1 that GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, be used in individuals who are not able to achieve the glycemic targets uh, despite the use of metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, or when these two agents are contraindicated, uh, for example, in cases of advanced uh, kidney failure. Now, this is given uh, a 1B recommendation. Now, this recommendation uh, is supported by the evidence of the cardioprotective effect of GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, a systematic review of the seven major cardiovascular outcome trials with GLP-1 receptor agonists found that the use of these agents is associated with a 12% reduction uh, in the risk for three-point maze or uh, in uh, cardiovascular deaths. Now, in addition, there was some suggestion that uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists have some kidney protective benefits. Now, in the same meta-analysis of the seven major cardiovascular trials, the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists showed a 17% reduction in a composite kidney uh, uh, endpoint, which included new onset albuminuria, uh, decline in EGFR, development of ESKD or renal death. Now, uh, I would like to highlight, however, that this effect was driven mainly uh, by the development of new onset macroalbuminuria um, and less so uh, by heart renal outcomes. Um, so therefore, the data for GLP-1 receptor agonists um, is not as strong yet uh, as when we compare it with SGLT2 uh, inhibitors for kidney protection. But GLP-1 receptor agonist is an attractive option um, as there is no requirement for dose adjustment uh, in patients with progressive decline in kidney function. Uh, Dilaglutide, for example, uh, may even be used uh, in patients with advanced stages of CKD uh, with EGFR greater than 15. So indeed, these are exciting times for the field of diabetic uh, kidney disease, where for a long period of time, uh, only RAS blockade ha had shown significant protective effect against kidney failure. Uh, there are ongoing trials on not just uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, but also on the effect of new mineralocorticoid antagonists in diabetic kidney disease. Now, taking on from the DARPA CKD trial, uh, the MPAR kidney study uh, will examine further the effect of MPAR glyphosate on kidney disease progression or cardiovascular deaths in individuals with chronic kidney disease um, with or without diabetes. 
um, the flow renal uh, outcome study will uh, specifically evaluate the effect of uh, semaglutide a long acting uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, using kidney endpoints as the primary outcome. Uh, and the Fidelio DKD uh, study will examine the benefits of a new mineralocorticoid antagonist, uh, Phenarilon, on reducing cardiorenal morbidity and mortality uh, in individuals with uh, type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Now, this upcoming uh, new trials uh, will definitely uh, provide more data uh, on how we would use uh, the, the armamentarian of drugs that we currently have uh, in uh, reducing the progression of diabetic kidney disease. Uh, therefore, to summarize the overall approach uh, to uh, antihyperglycemic therapy in individuals with diabetic kidney disease, uh, lifestyle modification continues to be general management goals. Um, metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors uh, will form the backbone for the baseline pharmacological therapy where metformin is used uh, mainly for the uh, purpose of glycemic control and SGLT2 inhibitors for organ protection, uh, predominantly cardioprotection and kidney protection. Uh, additional drug therapy are considered based on a few factors and should be individualized um, to the patient, taking into account uh, patient preferences, uh, comorbidities, uh, the EGFR, as well as the cost. Uh, and the guideline uh, summarizes nicely the personalized approach to antihyperglycemic agents. Uh, it uh, matching the different clinical scenarios uh, uh, to the preferences and suitability uh, for particular therapy. So, for example, uh, the, uh, this uh, very nice uh, summary uh, figure uh, suggested uh, for patients uh, with uh, low EGFR. Uh, the more suitable medications would include a DPP-4 inhibitor, uh, insulin uh, or sulfonylurea uh, thiazolidine, as well as uh, alpha-glucosidase inhibitor. Um, if one uh, is uh, managing someone with a significant risk of hypoglycemia, um, sulfonylurea and insulin should be avoided and because they are of higher risk for developing uh, low blood glucose and other drugs should be considered. So these um, should be a mix and match and provide uh, a personalized approach uh, in managing our patients. So to summarize, now this is the first published uh, KDGO guideline on diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Uh, it provides recommendations and practice points on five different uh, areas, which included comprehensive care, uh, glycemic monitoring and targets, uh, lifestyle interventions, uh, the use of antihyperglycemic therapies, as well as approaches to the management of patients. Now, patient-centered decision-making and support and consistent efforts at improving diet and exercise remain the foundation of all glycemic management. Uh, control of risk factors, including the use of RAS blockade, remains part of the standard of care. Uh, we have suggested that glycemia continue to be monitored uh, with HbA1c and to be supplemented with blood glucose when necessary. Glycemic targets should be individualized with focus on uh, the increased risk for hypoglycemia with declining renal function. Uh, we suggested and recommend the use of uh, metformin as the initial therapy for uh, the purpose of glycemic control and this should be followed by SGLT2 inhibitor um, when organ protection is necessary. Uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist could be used, therefore, as an alternative. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention.